But what he did instruct them to do was build a temple too. And this is the place that God occupied back then. So this, you know, he occupies this place in our heart right now today. Back then he occupied a physical place and Moses, as well as the high priest, would go in and sacrifice. They would sacrifice to God and once a year they would enter the Holy of Holies, right, which is the innermost sanctuary. And any time the high priest would go in there to offer sacrifice, and I just read this and I forgot about it, it's true, he would actually have to turn his back and, and go in backwards. They would tie a rope to his, or to a belt or to his ankle, right? Um, in case something happened, if for some reason he died, they'd ha you know, no, nobody could go in there but him once a year, so they'd have to pull him out, right? Now this, this veil that covered the temple was thick, it was like, a hand breadth, so it was probably six to eight inches thick. It was at least this thick, woven, woven threads. Like, can you imagine how thick? Thick. And it was, I think, 60 feet high, roughly 30 feet wide, which isn't, isn't huge. Like, when I think of the temple sometime and I read these stories, I'd think, man, this is this humongous place. And it, it really, the, the, inner, the, the Holy of Holies is not, was not a huge, huge place. So, but when you understand the, the, the sanctity of that space being the presence of God, which we couldn't be in without totally going through this ritual of getting prepared for that. Uh, and then you kind of set it against where we are today. It is an amazing contrast. So, you know, it all works together, right? So when you look at this painting, and this was something that Colleen, um, the, actually the original of this is hanging in my living room, which I absolutely love. Mark's daughter, painted all of these, in case you didn't know that. And we have the originals. Um, and there are print, the prints that are made for, out here, I want to explain these so you'll, you'll never look at them the same way again. In fact, when you go by, I would hope you start to really settle in a little bit more and think more about what this represents and why it is even there. So what you see represented here is the temple veil. Now, there's something different about this than the one in the Old Testament. If many of you remember um, what happened when Christ died, when he offered up his life, what happened? At that moment when he said it's finished, what happened? Right. And how did it tear? Yeah, how did it tear? Top to bottom. If you guys pull these out if you don't have them. Uh, top to bottom. Now, you've got to understand about something this thick, eight inches. You could tie horses. You could probably put a locomotive on each end of this thing. It would not tear. This is not an easy task to pull off, okay? So again, it was clearly a miraculous occurrence. Now, at the same time, there were, you know, people, you know, some of the saints rising from the dead. I mean, this is the coolest story ever. If you really dig into the, the scene and put yourself in this scene, like, this is amazing stuff. Like, okay. So when you think about this veil tearing from top to bottom, what was the message that God was sending? Yeah, what was it? What was that message? What did that mean when that temple was... Down. Well, I mean, but there's something he was stating, like he was stating. Go ahead. Will. That we don't need... There's no division now between us and God. Perfect. Do you guys get that? That was the message. <laughs> Yet, yeah, you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they probably went in there and scrambled to sew this thing up again. <laughs> And if you look at their lives and how hard it was to, to um, penetrate that life that they were living, you'll understand their whole spirit, religious spirit, was, was the reason why this had to take place. This was symbolic. I mean, I don't know. If I, again, if I'm standing there and this happens, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand it. I probably should. It's like a Red Sea moment to me. Like, why would you not really question and go, what does this really mean? And I'm sure many of them did, right? I'm sure many, many of the, the Pharisees, the, the, the uh, priests, the, 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 the Jews at that time, who believed that he should be crucified and, uh, and a thief that set free, I'm sure many of them changed their mind when they started seeing dead people walking around Jerusalem that they knew were dead, when they, start, when they saw this occur, and it, it kind of the bell went on and said, oh my gosh, like, I get it now. The reason he came was not to sit on the throne, it was to give his life for me and you. And so when that happened, the depiction of what you see here, and this was, this is Colleen, uh, and I don't do this decent justice, which, but I'm not in her head when, the, when God gave her this vision. And she asked 
knew that at some point or another she wanted to see it represented on, on paper. What you see represented behind it is the garden. So we've just talked a lot about Genesis 1 and 2 and what it was like in the garden. What, when that veil tore, it gave us every right to step back into the garden, back into our rightful place, our identity, to the place in which God's called us, His garden. Now, does that mean that it's going to be an easy journey back into the garden? No. Like, there's going to be a lot of, like, there's probably some briars in this garden because it's not the original one, <laughs> okay? And we're going to get cut, and we're going to get hurt, and we're going to trip, and we're going to fall. But here's the coolest thing ever. He gave us the right to go back in. We don't need a priest. We don't need anybody else to intercede. We can walk and talk with God today just like we could back then. And we can in, in a moment's notice. And one of the things that you're gonna, we're going to talk a little bit more about next week and the following week is what does practical conversational intimacy with God look like? For everybody in here, that's going to be different. All right? So what, you know, Col we'll talk about it, but what, Col what she experienced, and she shared some of that with you, and what I experienced is something completely different. Like, she has this kind of freaky way to, like, walk around and hear, like, in her, in her spirit every, all the time, like, what's going on. In the spiritual, like, she, it's conversational for sure. Uh, for me, I, you know, I've experienced God a lot of different ways. I, he definitely instructs me, and I'll share something with you in a minute when I look at the other tree, which is the tree of brokenness. But it's, it's different. Um, I, I think from her, uh, you know, I sometimes God speaks to me through experiences, like through or through circumstances around me. Something happens, and I go, "Oh my gosh, that's him!" Like God showed me something in that circumstance. I mean, the best way He can talk to us, number a, number one, is through His Word, through the Bible, through that app that I listen to, through the Bible that's sitting in front of many of you. That's, I mean, that's Him. Like that's that's God on paper. That like we want to know Him. That's where we'll go. We'll go to the Word. But there are times when we don't have the exact words in the Bible that we need to guide us into a decision in our life. Like, how do we, what do we do in a particular situation where I'm faced with maybe a new career change or, or you're faced with a relationship, a question in a relationship that doesn't seem healthy, perhaps, and maybe you need to make a decision to set some boundaries and to step beyond that. We'll talk about safe people because I and many in my times in my life have considered someone safe and I've kind of cast my pearls before swine and watch them get trampled. It's a, it's, it's a hard place to live when you, when you put yourself out there and have somebody take advantage of that. Okay, so, so how do you make decisions about relationships or about a career or about even your time here at Water Street? Like, when is it, when, when is it time? Like, when is it time to, to move on? Or, or maybe, you know, God's called me into a different place here. Uh, you here in relationships or how you volunteer, the things that your, 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 your task assignments, things like that, like what, what would be the best thing for me to... Everybody in here has a talent, a skill, an ability that's different than the next person. So there might be somebody great on the front desk and somebody better helping somebody in the showers, you know? <laughs> so, so all I'm saying is that, you, you know, little decisions you think aren't as important, God wants to, to live them out in with you every day of your life. And, and you just have to ask Him. So it's part of that journey of, of stepping back into the garden and discovering what intimacy really looks like and knowing how, His voice, because His voice, you know, the enemy can be pretty deceptive. So you have to, you know, it's okay to pray. God is not, though, a God of, of fear uh, so there's a lot, of re a lot of ways you can start to discern that, not simple, but the freedom is to do that, and that's what this represents. So when you walk by this next time, just think a little bit about the freedom that you have been given now that Christ has substitutionarily died for our sins, and we no longer need a priest to sacrifice on our behalf, okay? And that's a lot of years ago when that was happening, but it's still happening today because it's, you know, we put... It's the, it's the altar of performance or, or trying to please other people that we, you know, we, we hang ourselves back up on the cross with Jesus. That's what, I, that's what I say a lot of times. We put ourselves back on the cross, and it's ridiculous. Like, we, there, there's no way that you're going to perform your way into heaven, yet we still think that way. And how many people know others? Like, I, I even see it in, in, in the church body a lot of times is there's an expectation for that. I think that's, that's something that we need to challenge each one of ourselves to start think, thinking differently about what that looks like.